So we are now hearing God chapter five in our series. And uh, just a note, we are midpoint because there are nine chapters in the book. So we are actually technically midpoint. And so you, for those of you who have been wondering, when will I stop reviewing all the chapters? <laughs> Today's the day that I will stop reviewing chapters one to four. Aren't you guys relieved? Right? So this is the day where I will not, re this is the day, the last day that I will actually review all the chapters. But for those of you who have, who have missed a few or just missed one or two, I will do, that, uh, to do the review this morning. So let's begin. Chapter one. What's the big idea of chapter one? Big statement right in the beginning for the entire book. People are meant to live in an ongoing conversation with God, speaking and being spoken to. The second uh, big idea, especially for this chapter, is that it's a statement of, uh, from Dallas when he said, I fear that many people seek to hear God solely as a device for obtaining their own safety, comfort, and sense of being righteous. In other words, safety and security from problems and suffering is not in God's mandate. And he is not obligated to provide you or me with safety and security from suffering. What he is, though, wants us to do is that in light of suffering and persecution, we are drawn closer to him and look towards him and find that he is always ever present in our lives as we go through the suffering, that he does walk with us in our suffering. We also must realize that if you've ever done any meditations and devotions in the Psalms, that the psalmist even acknowledges that God is not there to protect him. God is there to walk with him through the suffering, to deliver him, shepherd him, lead him through the storms of his life, and continue to be reminded that there is hope at the end of eternal life and quiet pastures and still waters in Psalm 23. Okay? Next chapter, chapter 2. The big idea in chapter 2 is the practice of wilderness. Why do we need the wilderness? Well, we looked into Elijah. Elijah was in a crisis, sort of like us sometimes when we have a crisis moment, like at work, in relationships, etc. There are days that each day we are faced with a crisis, and unfortunately, life keeps on going, and we're going to face that crisis the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and then suddenly new crises happen. Where do we go? Well, in light of that crisis, Dallas Willard looked into Elijah, and we looked into Elijah, saying, wow, Elijah needed God, but where did he find him? Not in light of our busyness. What did he do? He stopped. And he went into the wilderness, alone with God, seeking God's presence. And when we encountered God, what did God do? He didn't just evaporate and, you know, make the crisis go away. He didn't do that, did he? What, he did, what did God do? He reminded who Elijah was, where Elijah is headed, why Elijah is here, and who God is in his life. And that's what we should be doing as well. Every day, do you have a wilderness moment uh, at our cell group uh, and on Tuesdays? Some of us go and play piano in a room. Some of us, like my wife, isolates herself in another room just to have quiet time with God. I do it in the gym because I need to do something. I'm a guy. So I need to run on the treadmill and then stare at something at the sky and then say, and then meditate on the words that I read before I went there. What's your wilderness moment? My dad's wilderness moment, he's watching this too, is on the toilet. I don't know why he spends half an hour on the toilet. There must be some problem, I guess. But he, he has 30 minutes on the toilet, and that's his quiet time. Whatever you do, seek God's presence in the wilderness. And then when you do, when he reminds us of his covenant and his promise with us, when he gives us hope, renew us, and gives us a fresh, what else does he give us? He gives us a new perspective. So that every day when we approach that crisis again, the next day, we come in with a new perspective. On to chapter 3. Chapter 3 is the emphasis of keeping our eyes on the Holy Spirit, to share in the Holy Spirit's activity. That's how we train ourselves to hear God's voice. I likened it to, to be dancing, right? Remember that analogy? Where if you saw a dancer, especially the one being led, just totally focus on the shoes that they are wearing, how their steps are, how other people worried about how other people are looking at the person at your at you. 
you're staring at my, I'm like looking at my suit, whether there's wrinkles or anything. Oh, how's my hair? How, like, how's my blah, blah, blah. But not focus on the Holy Spirit. What happens? Well, the dance looks awful, for one thing. But then I stumble. I will fall. I will be confused. Because I'm not looking at the Holy Spirit. I'm just looking at myself. One of the practices that we explored that day was the practice of contentment. The shared activity of contentment. Because that draws our eyes from ourselves back to God. It draws our eyes to fix on the Holy Spirit. What did Paul say in Galatians? If we walk by the Spirit, be led by the Spirit, and live by the Spirit, what do you produce? The fruits of the Spirit. What does he mean by that? It means that you're not obligated to practice the, whole, the, the fruits of the Spirit. It will burst out of you when you, are, when you fix your eyes on the Holy Spirit. You are, wait, sorry, you do have the fruits of the Spirit. You were originally created with the fruits of the Spirit. What the Spirit wants to do is lead you, guide you, and make you burst out with the fruits of the Spirit. So we must allow him to do that. Next chapter, chapter 4, I find that the best summary is this one statement. If you find yourself in a position where you can honestly say, God has never spoken to me, then you might ask yourself, why should God speak to me? Am I truly doing, am I, what am I doing in life that would make speaking to him, speaking to me a reasonable thing for him to do? Am I in the business together in life or am I in the business just for myself? In other words, am I really truly in business doing God's business or am I in my own business? Many times like I say to myself, God, are you there? Are you really speaking to me? Where are you? And then when things don't really happen for me, like nothing gets answered for some reason, like God is absolutely silent, I go, does he even exist? Some of my friends lost their, their, their faith because they thought that, they, well, God doesn't care anymore then. He doesn't exist because if he did, he would have answered my prayers. But the question for, from Dallas and the question that we explored actually this last week was, maybe he is speaking to us, but the things that he's saying may not be what we want to hear. We only hear what we want to hear. Maybe we're not even in the business of his business, and it's just about the business for ourselves. We're not in line. Or what Pastor Fritz one time said in chapter one, we're not in two. We don't have the right frequency to receive his word. We hear only what we want to hear. OK, let's cross our fingers, and let's begin with chapter five with a video. <laughs> Anyway, before I was so rudely interrupted, at that time, I was a Federal Express man. What the hell are you doing, boy? I can tell by how you talked about him. This ego's bad news. We're here to save Quill. For what? Huh? For honor? For love? No, I don't care about those things. I want to save Quill so I can prove I'm better than him. I can lord this over him forever. <laughs> what are you laughing at me for? Uh, you can fool yourself and everyone else, but you can't fool me. I know who you are. You don't know anything about me, loser. I know everything about you. I know you play like you're the meanest and the hardest, but actually you're the most scared of all. Shut up! I know you steal batteries you don't need, and you push away anyone who's willing to put up with you, because just a little bit of love reminds you how big and empty that hole inside you actually is. I said shut up! I know them scientists what made you never gave a rat's ass about you! I'm serious, dude! Just like my own damn parents who sold me, the old little baby into slavery. I know who you are, boy! Because you're me. I played this video because it reminded me of my past life. Um, I always wonder, like, uh, you know, some of, the, some of us question whether God speaks through non-Christians. And I believe he does. Because uh, when I was working for an electronics company, the like, which I'll not name, but it's the color blue and yellow. Uh, it's, um, <laughs> so it's uh, basically, 
I had a manager because I was a buyer, and I had a manager, and then uh, he saw how I behaved. And then he actually did what that blue guy did, Yondu. And he did say, you're like me. But he, before that, he kept on addressing every single nuke and cranny that he noticed of my character flaws. Pride, impatience, aggressiveness, stuff like that. And then, it, you know how I felt that day? I felt hurt. My pride, <laughs> I felt this tiny first. Then I said, how dare you talk to me like this? Right? You know, like inside me, I was building up heavy anger. And I didn't sleep for the whole week. Because he did that to me. I can't believe anyone did it. Then I was reminded of a verse. Search me, God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me. And lead me in the way of everlasting. Search me. Dang, that hurts. He revealed to me, my boss revealed to me, and I still love him for it. He's now moved on. You won't find him. He's over to, in Manitoba, but he, just, he revealed everything about me. And I firmly believe that God was using him that day to reveal who I was. That was offensive to God. Anyways, let's move on. That was not in the script. <laughs> okay. The Bible, we encounter several ways that God speaks to his audience. Now, the audience can be large crowds or individuals. Now, we know that, right? We, uh, for some of us who are familiar with the Bible, we realize that God does speak to large crowds, right? Uh, remember the pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire when uh, he was leading the Israelites out of Egypt? We knew that. We also knew in the New Testament that he thundered his voice in front of everyone, that this is my son whom I love and well pleased during Jesus' baptism. So the crowds, we know that. But also we know that he speaks specifically to people individually. And this is where we're concerned about in our series, right? Uh, we knew about Samuel, right, from Eli. Pastor Fritz gave us that example. David, Moses, all the prophets, Mary and Joseph. Now, in the Bible, one thing is clear and true, though. God spoke in those days, God still speaks today, and God will speak again. And we don't doubt that he can speak in many ways, just like he did back then. So the question for us today, this morning, how does God speak to us today? This morning, I would like to explore the human spirit of things. Willard actually said, oh, sorry, I skipped a few. Willard said there's actually a few ways that uh, God speaks in the Bible. Phenomena, angels, dreams and visions, audible voice, human voice, and the human spirit, which we equate, and he gave us examples that it's like the conscience or our soul, etc. So what we're concerned about this morning to, is the human spirit, our conscience, our thoughts. Why? Because for Dallas, this is the most common and primary, primary subjective way that God addresses us. Not only that, but I want to share this particular way because it relates to me personally the most, myself. I found that throughout my entire, I became a Christian at 18, 35, 40, 22 years, like uh, the past 22 years, God has spoke to me through my conscience, through my thoughts. I didn't, I didn't have a burning bush. I, I didn't have a lightning raining down on me, <laughs> right? I, but I really believed that throughout my past 22 years as a Christian that God spoke to me through my conscience. Now, I said, say this because for you, it may be different. God may speak to you differently. It may not be through con your conscience like I did. Maybe it's the same. But God could use a variety of things for different people. We're all created differently. Okay. So, this, we're going to be talking about the human spirit. The big idea in this chapter five is this one sentence, or two. God comes to us precisely in and through our thoughts, perceptions, and experiences, and that he can approach our conscious life only through them, for they are the substance of our lives. We are, therefore, to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. God's gracious incursions to our souls can make out thoughts his thoughts. He will help us learn to distinguish when a thought is ours alone and when it is also his. In other words, Willard states that ultimately, we need to continue to nurture and allow the Holy Spirit to develop our mind to be the mind of Christ. As Paul would say in 1 Corinthians, he gave us a state of mind that we're, our goal is supposed to be at. Who has known the mind of the Lord so to instruct him? 
but we have the mind of Christ. Now, we're not there yet. A lot of us are not there yet, including myself. But we are a work in progress towards the mind of Christ. That's the state that we want to be in. The state of maturity that we can be confident that, just like the disciples and Paul, that everywhere we go, everything we do, every thought we have, every word we say is of Christ. Can we be confident of that right now, at this moment when we're sitting here? For me, no. How about you? Let's work on it together. In Ad, here's some examples of how the, the disciples and Paul just knew that their actions and decisions are from Christ. Acts 16, verse 6 to 7. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. They felt that. Yeah, you see it? In Acts 20 to 22, 22 to 23, and now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, I meaning Paul, not knowing what will happen to me, I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. How did they know? How did Paul know this? Okay, you got to remember this. In Acts, I don't know if you're familiar with Acts, but it was just not one time that Paul wanted to go to Jerusalem. It was two. First time, the, his friends said, Paul, you're being a little stupid, <laughs> right? If you go, they're going to kill you, right? For sure. And Paul says, you're right. The Holy Spirit is, not, is telling me that I should not go. Second time, though, especially in Acts 20, his friends, what did they do? They said the same thing. Paul, you're stupid. You're going to go. They're going to kill you. But this time, Paul says, I am compelled by the Holy Spirit to go. What? Same words from his friends, but different result. How did he know? This is where we're going to start. Where do we begin? How do we begin to start to train and nurture our mind to be that of Christ? How do we be begin? Well, I entitled this sermon, Search Me. I believe that we got to start all together as a body of Christ to start by allowing the Holy Spirit examine each of us. We ask the Holy Spirit and allow the Holy Spirit shine and reveal the things in our lives on how he sees them. Search me, God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in my everlasting, in a way of everlasting. Holy Spirit, in other words, we should pray to the Holy Spirit and say, examine me, please, and see if corrections to my current condition are needed. Find out what is wrong and repair it. Are we asking ourselves for the Holy Spirit to what this Psalm says, search me? Is there not anything that we are doing, is there anything that we are doing right now, today, if we take a snapshot of our lives, that God would not approve? Are we allowing him to reveal everything of our lives that he may not approve? Like what my manager did to me, my boss, saying this is, is not you. This shouldn't be you. This is not what a human being should be like, he said. Be better than that. He's not a Christian either. But he, I believe that God spoke through him that, John, you need to search yourself. You need to search yourself. Okay, here's an example. A few years ago, my wife and I applied for life insurance. Yes, uh, because Annabelle was born. So we go, oh, time to buy some life insurance. So I don't know if you know the process of life insurance, but um, she'll, she'll do that whole seminar on investing and we'll teach you through that. Life Labs would come over <laughs> and to your place and do some tests on you. Some of the tests is like blood tests, okay? And so I took a blood test, and then uh, she drew out some blood, and then, uh, and then she and drew out some blood from uh, Rosanna, and then they went off, you know, and did their test. The results came three months later, and lo and behold, for some odd reason, Rosanna got a bigger discount than I did. Like, I go, what? i like, this is, what? Like, I was confused, she was confused. Go, like, wait a minute, I exercise more than she does. Like, I, I go to the gym three times. Well, back then, she never even visited the gym, right? Like, how on earth did I get a lower discount than she did, right? Oh, it's my pride talking again. 
But apparently, uh, I had something wrong with me and I didn't know about it. So the doctor also got the report, also got the results. And don't you hate it when your doctor's office calls you and you go, you better come here right away. <laughs> and then suddenly, and then you go, why? Oh, don't worry, the doctor will tell you. <laughs> it's like, but you gotta come right away. Are you not gonna tell me what, what's wrong? No, nope, can't do that. You gotta come right away though. Is there anything wrong? I can't say that, come right away. <laughs> it's like, doesn't that create, give you some anxiety right there? Like, you know, so, and it was a week, okay? That was a week, the appointment was next week. So then all through that, uh, those days, I'm like, oh my, it's like, do I, like something wrong with me? Anyways, I went to, the day I came and I went to the doctor and the doctor said, told me that, Jonathan, you have fatty liver. Your liver enzymes are too high. And then I go, what? And uh, yeah, and then what's freaky is that if your liver enzymes are too high and you're a fatty liver, since you're Asian, you are prone to have liver disease, which could be liver cancer. So I advise you to stay away from all the white stuff, the legal kind. That was a joke. Carbs. Yes, <laughs> the, the carbs, right? Uh, like uh, flour, bread, and guess what? Us Asians eat rice. rice. He told me to stay away from white rice. <sighs> right? How can anybody refrain from white rice? Practically everything we eat has rice. The dim sum we eat has rice. Right? White, apparently. And, I, and so then I, when, I, when I heard this, I was shocked. I go, I can't do this. It's a lifestyle change. It's a huge lifestyle change. So what did I say? What did I do? You know the four stages of death? <laughs> One of them was doubt, right? So I doubted my uh, doctor. Maybe he's wrong. Maybe he's overreacting. Maybe Life Labs got the wrong results. There's tons of Jonathan Chans out there, <laughs> right? Like, uh, maybe he got the wrong results. And then it's only I go, then I feared, oh, what will happen, right? Like, like, how is my life going to be like without this white rice that I need? right, and cherish so much. Uh, what would my parents think when they cook for me, right? Suddenly no white rice, right? Then came acceptance. I had to accept it. And I said to myself, in a, uh, through my wife's urging, <laughs> right, I, like, I accepted it and I had to change. And lo and behold, we cut out every white thing, including the sugars. Everything that was refined apparently is white. So we cut out every white goodie and uh, sweets and such. And once I did that for a few months, I had to go back to an exam. My liver is back to normal, and hallelujah. But also I realized throughout that whole time, I realized that during that whole practice, my whole life changed, actually. My whole physical condition was different. It wasn't just, um, you know, uh, just to cut out the white rice and then my liver. It was actually my entire body became better. Things actually got better. So is with God. When we allow God to, to examine us, to allow him to reveal to us what needs to be fixed, it's not just for that particular thing. It is for our entire life. We gain a better perspective of life. Every circumstance is a, is better, is a, has a different perspective. And I'll give you an example for myself as well, again. I realized that throughout my past 20 years of my career, every time I tell God uh, and ask God, examine me, Lord, and he reveals something, especially that big pivotal moment with my manager, I realized that now, at this moment, today, when things happen to me, or when uh, people critique me or criticize me, or when things, proverbial things hit the fan, I approach it differently. I, I do. Maybe uh, like a, I am more patient. I come in with a different perspective. I'm not perfect. By all means, I'm not perfect. I'm not saying that I'm completely perfect and I hit mine of Christ right away. No, I'm just saying that, man, like Rosanna sees it too, that I'm different when it comes to that situation. That when things happen, I don't approach it the same way as I approached it 10 years ago. It's different. So I, it's a promise to all of us that when we allow God to examine us, it's not just for that particular one thing. He's revealing it to us because he wants our entire lives to have a different perspective, our lives to have be different. It's not just that one little thing. Search me, God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. 
So Willard says this, so God uses our self-knowledge or self-awareness, which is heightened and given a special quality by his presence and direction, to search us out and reveal to us the truth about ourselves and our world. So, which means that what I just said is, as he, we allow him to examine us, and he reveals who we are and our nooks and crannies in our lives, we actually have a heightened awareness of who we are. And when the circumstances arise again, the same circumstances, it's funny about this world, history repeats itself. So the crisis repeats itself. It's just in a different code, right? It's just that basically you would find yourselves, you and I would find ourselves seeing it differently every time. More and more like Christ and less and less like our old selves. So when we allow God to examine our lives, we have to open every cupboard, every drawer, every door of our lives to him, allowing his light to shine in us, to allow to illuminate where, like, what kind of stuff that he does not please him, that he might find offensive. And therefore, he, he, we have to allow him to address things. Now, remember the big statement that I just said uh, early on? The one word I needed you to focus on, which I forgot to tell you, is substance. Substance. And what did Willard say if you read the book? The Willard actually addressed substance as this. It's our families, our careers, our reputation, our sexuality, and every single thing that is important to us. Substance. We have to allow God to address substance, the substance of our lives. Many times, even including myself, when I go to a sermon, and if it's very abstract and up aloof, you know, what I mean by that is just all principles and theory and theology, and nothing really hit you on the ground, I tend to go, okay, that's good, good to know. But I find the sermons that really hit me are the ones that really hit at home in my backyard. How's your pride? How's contentment? How's your dealing with money? What are you seeing in investment? How did you react with the tax? changes, et cetera, et cetera. How did you react with the interest rates going up on your mortgage? How did you react? Those things. Things that are important to us. I firmly believe that if, if, I do not do, if I'm at the pulpit and I do not address current conditions of our hearts, I'm not doing my job. The gospel needs to address our lives. The gospel has to be relevant. And in order to do that, we have to, each of us, allow the gospel to address relevantly to the substance of our lives. What is truly important to you right now? Is it relationships? Is it finding a home? Is it the money? Is it your career? Those things. Allow the gospel to address those. So as we grow in grace, God's laws increasingly form the foundation of our hearts, Willard says. His love is our love. His faith, our faith. Our very awareness of our actions, intentions, and surroundings then bears within it the view that God takes, bringing things into clarity of his vision, just as a candle might illuminate what is at our dinner table. In other words, he's saying this. As we continue, this is the great start and the good step each day. As we continue to allow the Holy Spirit to examine us, guess what happens? Just like my exam, my life labs, it's not just that particular sin or that particular thing that God finds offensive. It's our entire body, our entire life, our whole substance changes and becomes more in line with Christ. Follow? It's examination. So question is, are any of us sitting here today in need of clarity of anything? In need of God showing us where we're headed? The first step then is to allow him to examine our hearts. Allow him to shine on every substance of our lives. Allow somebody else, a human voice, to intervene. I have two mentors. One of them is being John Stackhouse. He calls me up. He called me up two weeks ago and says, how are you doing? Where are you at? What are your concerns? How do you see God in it? That was his question. Right? Do you have somebody that could speak into your life like that? If you don't, I encourage you to find one. And if you need one, I'll pray with you to find one. But we need people, the human voice, to speak into our lives. Just like my manager did to me, to address those things. Because we might not see them. 
we have to pray to the Holy Spirit to have that boldness and courage to actually allow that to happen too, right? Uh, just like you saw on the, on the um, movie snippet, right? <laughs> that guy was pretty bold to speak to that raccoon, right? But we also have to be willing to receive it and say, you're right. Help me to correct myself then. Lord, help me to fix that. Then as you allow him to correct us, our eyes, our hearts, and our minds will be open and see the life that is everlasting as the psalm promised. Search me, God. Know my anxious thoughts. Lead me in the way of everlasting. That's the promise that God gives us. A mind that has everlasting mind. Now, last thing, I put Leonard Cohen. He recently passed away. When did he pass away? A year ago? Last year? Well, I listen to Leonard Cohen. I don't know about you, but I do. I know I'm kind of odd. I'm like probably the only Asian guy that listens to Leonard Cohen. But one of his songs uh, had a lyric here. Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Why I use this about passage is this. I want to close it off with this. It takes a lot of humility to understand that we are broken people. We're not perfect clay pots. If we continue to think that we're perfect, if we continue to think that our lives are great, if we continue to pursue that, with that think that, and have that paradigm that this is a, what a perfect life should be, if we continue to fixate ourselves on that, we're continuing to increase the layer and layers of that wall in that pot. How on earth does light get in if there is no cracks in it? We need to acknowledge that we are broken people. We need to allow the light to shine in. We need to have cracks. We need to break our walls. We need to shatter them, perforate them, so that light shines in. Jesus said the same thing to the Pharisees. You are broken people, but one thing is you need to acknowledge that you're broken. Come to Jesus, say we're broken, fall on our knees, and allow the light to shine in to everything. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your words. We thank you for the promise of the psalmist that you have given to the psalm to give to us. That when we allow your Holy Spirit to examine us, to search us, to know our anxious thoughts, to reveal to us who we are, to allow your Holy Spirit to fix us, to correct those things, that's not just those, those specifics, but it's our entire life. For you, for you promise that when we do, you'll lead us in a way of everlasting to have a mind of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray.